What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, March 25th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Big Tech's latest obsession is finding enough energy. Nice little AI theme to start us off. Next up, from our favorite friend, David Blackman, Center Sunday's energy absurdity, quote, when the best laid climate alarm plans go awry. Love this story, and we love ourselves some David Blackman. Next up, Glencore abandons coal production cap as another climate Pledge fails. Got to love it over there in Australia. Next up from the Energy Bad Boys. We love them. Um, check out their sub stack. This is a, an opinion piece from the Energy Transition in Retreat. Arizona moves to repeal its renewable mandate. And following along that thread, Wood Pellet producer Enviva files for bankruptcy and plans to restructure. So Stu will cover all that, then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on. In the oil and gas markets, we will quickly touch on rig count. Some interesting nuggets in there. Next up, Ripstone Capital introduces um, a statement in support of Kimrich's proposal um, to go ahead and combine Silver Bow with Kimrich Texas Gas. So there's a little gang up going on. There's some good quotes in this article, too. And then finally, BlackRock um, pushes back after Texas withdraws its $8.5 billion investment. I think BlackRock's painted themselves into a corner here, so that's why I wanted to cover this here, the end nice. of the statement on Friday. Um, we will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. Um, as always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Let's just go ahead and kick this off. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddy over here with, uh, let's go with, uh, I'll take big tech latest obsession, finding enough energy uh, behind door number two. Uh, the AI boom is an insatiable appetite for electricity. And this is actually causing one of the biggest problems in the world. Energy hypocrisy. Let's go green. No, we need everything we can get. Oh, let's shoot down nuclear. You're seeing, you're already getting a sense for what's going on in our energy thread today. In the uh, uh, Sarah week, we're sitting here, uh, Bill Vass, Vice President of Engineering and Amazon Web Services said the world adds a new data center every three days. Holy cow, Batman. We're talking some serious a heat generation. People don't realize how much cooling <coughs> data centers have to have. Yeah. Uh, we're going to build a hundred gigawatts of new recyclables in a few years. You're kind of stuck where it says we're not going to build a hundred gigawatts of new reno renewables. Dominion Energy uh, in uh, Richmond is really trying to pick up energy demand. They are, uh, they've got data centers coming out the wazoo up there <laughs> and they've got some serious problems. So let's take a look. We're putting the accelerator down on developing these clean resources. They are missing the boat. Uh, honestly, nuclear is the only way you're going to be able to solve AI's demand hunger necessity and second only to that is natural gas that's all you're gonna those are your two choices the others no. cannot be attached to the grid fast enough natural gas first nuclear second wind and solar are incapable physically in order to get this done you gotta love it this article it really highlights a very interesting conundrum that a lot of these big tech companies are coming into. They want to transition so much to green, but in order to power these massive data centers that can run these huge AI models, but guess what? You're going to need power at the cheapest possible cost. Even more than just, I mean, you think that data centers right now, the current today's data centers need low cost energy. You're only going to need more as these models get bigger and bigger and, and bigger and bigger. And three weeks ago, uh, Michael, you and I talked on the podcast about Amazon uh, Web Services bought a nuclear reactor from a university. That's how you're going to get data centers. 
you're going to support your, you know, instead of that old uh, movie, support your local gun sheriff, uh, sheriff, you're going to have to go support your local university's uh, nuclear and buy their cotton picking reactor. It's already sitting there. It's the only yeah, way you're going to be able to do this. Yep. It's, it's, it's a little bit crazy. And I think that people are going to start realizing that very quickly. And you're going to see even a quicker shift to the, natural gas is clean crowd it's going to become very apparent that that's where we need to spend all of our time and spend time reducing methane okay one last thing this uh i'm going to go to the next article here and just real quick Catherine blunt from the wall street journal wrote this story i want to give a shout out to Catherine. i interviewed her almost a year ago or more mm -hmm. and uh it was pretty cool i don't understand uh how that just happened my camera ai knew that i was talking about Catherine blunt from the for our podcast listeners it's it ai zoomed, it's ai it just zoomed in on my nose now that we we're talking about it all right let's go to the next one here sunday's energy absurdity when the best laid climate plans go awry we're talking about indian point nuclear station in new york new york you can't buy entertainment from three places in the world michael Germany, New York, and California. My three favorite places. And Michael, guess who? what our three top places in the world that listen to our show is? California, Here, New York. New York, and Germany. Unbelievably. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm sitting there watching our screen half the time. Uh, this article is from David Blackman's Energy Absurdities. New York official finally retired the Indian uh, Point nuclear plant, the last nuclear plant facility in state in 2021. The climate al alarmist cheered and went, yay, here's what's funny. New York's deteriorating and unloved Indian Point nuclear facility finally shut down uh, from a client climate change point of view it's a real step backwards and it made harder for new york city to decarbonize its electric uh, supply than it could have been it is a cautionary tale that has left new york in a really big challenging spot their co2 emissions has gone up in new york city why didn't ai zoom in on my forehead then because i'm making a big point new york's net zero goals are going away <laughs> wow well, it's it's anyway the, the fact that we're racing to replace nuclear with unreliable renewables especially in a state like new york massive cloud cover hard to have onshore wind so a lot of it's got to be offshore but you know it's a huge harbor how are you gonna have you know you're gonna have these boats navigating around these massive wind farms it's it, it truly is an energy in in an energy absurdity and i love what he says it's a cautionary tale and all those poor new yorkers have been left in a really challenging spot consisting of well better stability and reliability on the power grid thanks to the 24 7 natural gas generation that has been chosen by them that's replacing the stable reliable power they're receiving from indian point how could possibly they have, and you know, he goes on to say, how could they possibly have a change of heart? Could it be they decided maybe it's a good thing to have reliable power? I hope so. I hope there's actually some people thinking over there. Well, you know, it's not too late you know, uh, to have a total funeral for Indian Point. And we saw this on several others. I believe it was Pennsylvania we talked about this past month that the decommissioning company that bought the uh, the nuclear plant there in Pennsylvania has got the license now to refire it up. Nuclear plants can be bought, uh, brought back online, so it's not dead yet. Uh, I have a feeling it'll come back online. Hey, yeah. let's go to the next one there, Michael. Glencore abandons coal production cap as another climate pledge fails. Can you guess what energy thread we're having this today? King Holy, Cole. It's, have it, we love thermal King Coal producer Glencore has withdrawn a promise of annual coal production below 150 million tons, backpedaling from a climate pledge it made five years ago. A coal production cap made in 2019 to run down its mines into retirement rather than to sell them. They can't do it. 
um, they've got to keep going because of demand. You have to have thermal coal or what's called coking coal in order to produce steel, in order to produce cement. Uh, there are new technologies, and I'm really excited about these new technologies. It means the energy transition may happen in 100 years or so, but it's coming. Let's get there, though. <laughs> I, I love this quote that comes out of uh, comes out of Glencore. Okay, Glencore is one of the largest commodity traders in the world. They've really been at the right. forefront of basically vertically integrating their stack in terms of from you know they you know things like Glencore, Trafigura, um, VTOL. They're commodities traders, but what all of these commodities traders, aka the intermediaries between the raw product and kind of the refined version of that and all of those subsets in between, they've pushed more and more into the production phase. We know VTOL has a decent amount of um, oil and gas assets that they physically own. Um, Glencore has really pushed hard into the metals and mining business, AKA coal. It's one of their biggest um, verticals right now. Uh, about two years ago, they went ahead and acquired Canada's tech resources, which is, as Stu mentioned, which is huge coking coal. That was about a $10.5 billion deal. The point of all this is, is if they can ramp up a little bit more coal production, their CEO, Gary Nagel says they're going to be able to spin it out. And actually it's going to be a new standalone coal company. We got to see what the reception. I'm sure BlackRock's all in on investing, um, but we'll come to that later. I love this interesting <laughs> quote. We consider the usefulness of also maintaining the coal production cap that was introduced in 2019. We determined that the previously stated coal production cap may now only be served to cause confusion. We have therefore decided to remove the coal production cap, anticipating that our production of thermal coal should continue to decrease over time. Huh? What? what? It's going to decrease, but we don't need the cap anymore. But so I think it is, again, it has a lot to do with the acquisition of this Canadian coal company, which had some assets in Australia. Um, but it really says it's attempting to phase out coal um, over time, which is interesting um, that their goal is by 2020 or 2040. Um, and there's an interesting, um, you know, they're, they're fighting a little bit of an activist investor campaign, um, ironically, at from uh, the Sydney investor Tribeca who wants to have them keep their coal division, which is right. ironically interesting. Glencore is expected to give its shareholders uh, voting capacity on this potential coal spin out, um, which yep. is absolutely unbelievable. Um, I, I the, love the activist the... investors in Australia are coming in to keep coal. Yes. And I think this is really funny because the article at the bottom of the article, Michael, it says that uh, we talk about the UK prime minister says they're delaying the EV rollout. And then it talks about in Sarah week, the phase out of carbon intensive cars was slowed down. So we have two slowdowns there. And then BP and Shell have also uh, mon uh, said they're slowing down. We should abandon the fa phase, uh, the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas. So there's now number three in the same article. So you actually have four uh, that are being stopped. And uh, it's a pretty amazing little article here. And it feeds right on into the next one, Michael. Yep. Let's go on. Hey, I love me some energy bad boys. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, Mitch Rowling and Isaac Orr, shout out to these two young men. Energy transition and retreat. Arizona moves to repeal its renewable mandate. And I tell you what, uh, Miss Producer, if you could slide in this first picture of Arizona and you see the Thelma and Louise wagon rolling off, it's uh, Mr. Uh, solar Panel and Mr. Windmill going off the cliff like Thelma and Louise. Uh, I love their, their, their sense of humor. Um, Arizona moves to repeal its renewable mandate. Uh, the, the whole costs were coming around quote, I welcome utility programs that actually reduce energy consumption and meet avoided costs, but not under the threat of commission mandates that can easily, easily be hijacked by financially interested stakeholders. Who does that sound like to you? Does his name re, uh, sound like Lurch? <laughs> King Hines? Hines 57? King, King Hines? Sig Heil. <laughs> uh, yikes. Yikes. <laughs> yikes. So anyway, I worry. There's another great quote in here. Uh, 
She says that uh, solar and interspecial groups are unhappy. Hmm. Yeah, I think I worry about being the only state in the country to repeal what is already an extremely modest RRPS sends a wrong signal to the industry. Take your business and your jobs and your dollars somewhere else. <laughs> it's, it's, it's called. Yeah, I love that. I love these guys. I love these guys. Aren't they fun? I just love and they 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 put fun and data out there. And Michael, mm -hmm. you and I and uh, Isaac and uh, Mitch are going to have our own special live energy bad boys, and we're going to go bad boys against the 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 newsbeat boys. We're going to have some kind of rumble. Interesting. Match. I love that picture, uh, Miss Producer. If you can throw the one up with Yoda, the grift is strong <laughs> with this one. That's just absolutely, it's absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. Well, there's right. one more that threads right into this, this wood pellet producer. Yeah, um, it is one more. Uh, wood pellet producer in, Vid in Vivia files for bankruptcy and plans for restructure. Michael, just a real quick note on this one. Maryland based in Vivia, there's nothing ecologically good about a company that takes wood pellets from u.s forests rare u.s for forests chops them up into wood pellets and then ships them around the world for people to burn there is nothing esg about it let's do a quote here considerably uncertainty exists regarding invivia's ability to renegotiate it uneconomic customer contracts yeah. entered into the fourth quarter of the 2022 fiscal year the global credit rating agency said oops yeah i mean it's uh it's uh, you would have who would have thought a wood pellet company was going to be able, i mean it's i can know, understand a billion of debt for a wood for a wood wood, wood chipping company guys come on would a wood chuck chuck uh chuck wood i can't even say it normally would a wood but... chuck chuck if it would cut chuck or whatever it's called <laughs> what i love is they also own 350 million to a german energy company that was a great investment by them Ruh -ruh. delaware <laughs> bank some delaware yeah. bank they own 780 million of the debt good luck yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, hey, off to you now. Yeah. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, and, and flip over to, to finance, guys. But before we do that, as always, we got to pay the bills around here. Thanks for checking us out um, at energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis um, that you're here and we're about to hear is brought to you by said website. Um, Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and oil and gas business. Hit the description below in all podcast platforms for um, timestamps, links to those articles, um, and other interesting stuff. Take our survey, hit dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. We've got some great partnerships we're working on um, that we are really excited to, to be talking about, hopefully here in the next couple weeks. So let's get some more stuff finalized before I go ahead and spring the boat on it. But as always, guys, energynewsbeat.com. You know, first, let's just do a quick uh, oil and gas update here um, uh, from the financial side. Um, oil prices on Friday mainly were held fairly flat due to the possibility um, of, a, of, a, of a ceasefire in Gaza. You know, unfortunately, you know, we're going to hear a lot of that stuff left and right. We don't quite know what's happening um, with some of those uh, um, negotiations. It's here one day. It's here the other. John Kidcliffe, partner again, you know, partner over at Again Capital. <laughs> I love that Again Capital. Again, it <laughs> happened again. Um, <laughs> everyone is watching what will uh, for the weekend, what we'll bring to Gaza. It, it, it looks like things will open up, you know, about 15, 20 cents higher um, with, with, with the close sitting there at 8063. Looks to open somewhere about 80, 82 here in a bit. Um, you know, our favorite U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, said that he believes um, that there could be an, a ceasefire this weekend. We haven't heard anything as of right now. So obviously we didn't know we didn't quite see what happens there. Um, we did see the U.S. dollar have kind of the second week of broad gains against another basket of currencies. Um, you know, the the other real impact was it was a drop in rig counts. Um, you can see right there. Um, an overall five count drop on, on U.S. rigs, um, one oil rig, four gas rigs. So oil rigs down to 509, gas rigs down to 1112. I mean, that 
what I don't see is why we're shedding oil rigs. I think that's the interesting thing to note here. As we've popped above 80, the reaction from the, the industry is what we're dropping rigs still, which is again an interesting note as some of these wells continue or some of these, you know, and, and is that because we're opting for more frack rigs? That frack count spread continues um to hold steady there. We'll see an update on that later the week. The other I, I found two articles super interesting, Stu, that I wanted to bring up. Ripstone Capital, they go ahead and issue a statement in support of Kimmerger's proposal for the merger between Silverbow and uh, Silverbow and uh, Kimmerger Texas Gas, which is their internal kind of gas company. This is an absolutely, um, where's the quote in here, Stu, is, is pretty unbelievable. Um, you know, it, it, let me let me find it here. They they do a pretty good job of just ripping them repeatedly. This is the quote out of the release: "Stu repeatedly ignoring shareholders' interests has become somewhat standard practice for Silverbow, as management and the board has pursued their own agenda at the expense." of the shareholders. Again, guys, this is Ripstone Capital. They're one of the larger shareholders in Silverbow, owning about 9.9%. They're in favor. So Kimbridge, obviously, is, they've got somebody on their train right now. Um, it's Ripsot Capital, excuse me, not Ripstone, but it just sounds cooler if, if, if it was. Everyone's got a stone in their name. Um, what they, <laughs> um, which is it's just absolutely like, hey, we're we're not against it over here. I love that, Stu. They're they're going after them right now. What they claim is that you know this this combination is going to further consolidate. They believe that the the twenty twenty five EBITDA of the combined company is going to be in line to peers. You know what I think is 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 going on here is I think what's going on here is a is a battle of management. Okay, so obviously Kimridge. Wrightstone, they're not necessarily a fans of what's going on with Silverbow's management right now. Now, you always wonder, one of the problems that oil and gas companies have had for a while is management has owned very little of the actual equity of the underlying company. So what does that mean? If you have no equity in a company that you're running, who cares about profitability? I'm getting my I'm getting my plan. I'm getting my compensation, you know, for a salary. I'm getting my benefits, but I have nothing tied to the success of the company. It's almost the anti of what Elon did with Tesla, where he said, I'm literally just going to put my entire compensation plan relative to, you know, these different financial benchmarks. That's not what's happening in the oil and gas business. You'd be shocked to find how little management teams, specifically of public companies, actually own of the underlying which means there's a slight misalign of incentives here if i own zero percent of a company but yet i'm in charge of its financial decision making well i'm going to do everything i can to increase my compensation you know i i i don't have the share and i i don't mean i would just you know bump my salary but i but i'm not financially incentivized in order to do the work of the shareholders which is what the ceo of a company is designed to do it's designed right. to watch out for the shareholders of the company so i think what they're calling out is a is a fact that is not unique to silverbow but it's now that they've got somebody trying to do a merger that clearly silverbow doesn't want now all of a sudden they're getting behind it because guess what happens kimbridge comes over they do this merger kimbridge is in charge now so yeah, guess right, what right. Yep. Their management team's gone. Now, they're not gone immediately, but they're gone within six months. It's a slow death. It's a profitable death for them. They're gonna Their change of control packages, I'm sure, are great. I'd love to have one of those change of control million-dollar packages in there, but... It doesn't. It, it doesn't mean that they're gonna go. That they're gonna go softly. But I do love the big one of the largest shareholders is siding with Kimbridge. It's gonna get spicy here. It's gonna get spicy. Oh yeah. Next up. And finally, I, I love this one. BlackRock issues a statement, pushes back after Texas um, public investment or uh, whatever the, the PFS. What is it? The uh, permanent public. school fund, the Texas permanent yes. school fund. They withdraw eight point five billion. So this happened earlier this week. We, we heard the announcement that the Texas pension um, or school pension is going to pull out of BlackRock due to their boycott of energy companies. Well, BlackRock on Friday went ahead and made a statement. BlackRock Vice Chairman Mark McComb responded to the letter that said they were dismayed by the announcement and that the decision puts, quote, short-term politics over your long-term fiduciary responsibilities. We urge you to reconsider your decision to prioritize Texas schools and family who have benefited from BlackRock's consistent long-term investment outperformance. Now, they go on to note that since the partnership began in 2000, 
Um, six, they've generated an excess of $250 million in profits, inclusive of fees. He also says that um, we fully comply with Texas law and fundamentally disagree with your assessment based upon Black's Rock's performance. Huh? Wait, we fully comply with the law. Why are they pulling out of this in the first place? Well, because they're boycotting oil and gas companies. So if, if they're pulling out money because you boycott oil and gas companies and BlackRock says, no, 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 we're actually complying with the law, does that mean BlackRock has inexplicably just told us that they're investing in oil and gas companies? They are. Well, I know they are, but now they're at least admitting it with their, they're, they're putting out press releases that say that. Yes. And, and so the, what the they're being penalized for uh, over your going telling their base, their uh, left wing green, uh, green New Deal, anti cow uh, farts going, we don't invest in fossil fuels. While you and I covered the fact buried last year in their things were pipelines in the Middle East. Whoa. Yep. So they've been doing it a long time. Yes, they were doing it. I applaud Texas. Go Texas. Oh, uh, absolutely. Stand up for them. Close the border. Close anybody. You know, I'll go get them here. I'll take that eight and a half billion. We'll go drill some dry holes. I'll show them what oil and gas is all about. I saw this great tweet last night. We'll have to, we need to bring it up here. It's I'm a, like, it, huh? I just pulled a Scooby for our, our podcast listeners. That's, got, huh? This is, we got to finish the show with this. Andy, can you pull this tweet up? Um, uh, this tweet up for me. Let me go ahead and find it here. Um, let me find it on my end. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. This is from uh, one of my favorite guys, rock underscore Boffin. I'm now asking all fast food cashiers if they want to round down in order to support my next dry hole. Done. Done. <laughs> he's even, he's the uh, IR guy of the week ca team captain. We IR guy of the week right there. Starting off the week strong um, underscore rock. Boffin, we absolutely love it. I will support your next dry hole. Absolutely. And I'll take some of this eight and a half billion and we'll go drill some dry holes ourselves. So what else you got, Stu? It's going to be a busy week. It's going to be a wildly crazy busy week. We're going to have a great week. All right, guys. Uh, well, with that, we'll uh, Real quick, I just want to give a shout out to all of the fantastic feedback we are getting from around the world on our conversations. Thank you to each and one of everybody around the world. I truly appreciate all the great feedback. We want to get to all of your questions. Thank you all very much. Yeah, we'll... I mean, I know a lot of the feedback is how do we get Stu off the show? We're working <laughs> diligently to find a, a co-host, a new co-host, but it may take longer than you think. So no, I'm just kidding, guys. We absolutely love it. Again, really appreciate the feedback. Subscribe everywhere, wherever you can find us. We appreciate it. With that, guys, we'll let you get out of here. Get back to work. Thanks for checking us out. Energy News Beat Podcast. We'll see you tomorrow.